Please let me welcome you on behalf of the organizers, C4, but also on behalf of the organizer of this side event, FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. My name is Bruno Kamart. I work for FAO in Bangkok. I work for the Forest Law Enforcement Governance and Trade Program uh, covering Asia and the Pacific. I will be your ses sessions moderator today. Today's topic, or to the topic of this discussion forum is equitable development, sustainable landscape, green growth, and poverty reduction. In this session, we will try to address a number of key questions. The first question is, what does forest management have to offer in the context of green growth? And how does or should this new growth principle influence current forest practices and investments in the sector? The second question we will try to address today is what is needed to make forest management practices or investments greener and more beneficial to people. So what are the inf incentive frameworks to encourage this greener forestry and greener forest investments? The third question will be, what will be the roles of the ASEAN forests, forests of the region, and its landscapes in this greener, equitable, and inclusive growth? The the structure of this session is relatively simple. I guess it's very similar to other sessions today. We will start with a number of presentations, followed by Q&A or discussions. And we will then have a summary uh, of the discussions and the key points that we would like to trans transmit to the organizers as our contribution to the overall objective of this uh, event. Let me introduce you briefly to the four speakers today. The, four spe the first speaker is Mr. Dr. Yurdi Yasmi, my colleague from FAO in Bangkok. He's a forestry policy officer uh, and, uh, like me, covers the region, so Asia and the Pacific. The second speaker is Ms. Ida Greenberry, uh, Managing Director of, the S of Sustainability and Stakeholder Engagement at Asia Pulp and Paper. The third speaker, Dr. Hadi Susanto Pasaribu, the Executive Director of AFOCO, or the ASEAN Forest Corporation. The fourth and last speaker, Mr. Adam Grant, um, who is the Manager for Investments and Operations at the New Forest Investment Asia. Our, our discussant or, or person who is going to summarize this session is Dr. Doris Capista Capistrano, Senior Advisor, sorry, Senior, ad Senior Advisor of the SDC ASEAN Swiss Partnership on Social Forestry and Climate Change. As I said earlier, she will summarize our discussions and key points, and especially try and summarize what is new, what comes out of this discussion as something that is new. Um, she will summarize our inputs in terms of policy development and research gaps, which is one of the objectives of this overall event. And also she will try and summarize what should be done next or our next steps. And last but not least, we will have a number of rapporteurs on the right or your left hand side, including Mr. Aaron Russell from C4. Thank you. So let me start with introducing the first speaker, Mr. Yudi Yasmi from FAO Bangkok. Thank you very much, Bruno. A very good afternoon to all of you. It is really a great pleasure for me to be here today with you to make a brief presentation on towards greener forestry sectors, what's really new. I might need your help in answering this question. In this talk, I will touch upon three things. First, I will uh, outline the green economy in brief, where the concept come from, and then I will also mention a few options of green investment in forestry. And then I will share a few experience from FAO related to green economy. So why are we pursuing green economy? I think this is a fundamental question. 
As we all know, societal progress is multidimensional, as it encompasses economic, sociocultural, and environmental aspects. However, in measuring progress, we tend to focus on limited economic indicators with inclusive growth sometimes getting lip service. Many societal collapses and crises recorded in history has been attributed to imbalanced social progress, neglecting, uh, neglecting social and environmental aspects. Resources are viewed as engine for growth, and we have pushed our resources to their, beyond their ecological limit. We are still losing our forests about 13 million hectares per year. Biodiversity has declined 30% since 1970s, and demand on natural resources has doubled since 1960. And now we are actually using an equivalent of 1.5 of our planet to support our activities. So how do we sustain this? This is a big question. And climate change come on top of all of these challenges and perhaps one of the biggest challenges that our society face nowadays. Given this background, world leaders at Rio Plus 20 committed to green economy as a vehicle or approach to, to achieve sustainable development. In short, green economy is a system which results in improved human well-being and improved social equity while protecting natural resources and reduce risk and ecological scarcities. In essence, it is low carbon, resource efficient and social inclusive. So the concept of social, uh, green economy itself support the very philosophy of people-centric sustainable development. In the context of green economy, forestry has to be viewed broadly, taking into account all aspects, economic, social, and environmental aspects. Perhaps this is nothing new to all of us, particularly to foresters because the very essence of sustainable forest management encompasses all these aspects. What is probably new is how can we put sustainable forest management into real practice with concrete action supported by political will. Green economy also presents an opportunity for forestry sectors to counter negative images and perceptions that are inherent in forestry sectors. For example, recurrent forest fires has actually devastated large tracts of tropical forest. Timber trades are often associated with illegal activities and loss of revenue on government sites. There are a lot of conflicts associated with uh, forestry sectors. So in order to counter these things, I think green economy offer an opportunity for forestry sector by uncovering the greener side of forestry. Here I will mention a few options that that are available for green investment. I'm pretty sure my colleagues here will have more examples. First of all, we have no other option than sustaining natural assets that we have. We cannot destroy these asset feathers. This means that we have to promote sustainable practices, and we have a few examples already existing. For example, reduce impact logging, forest certification, development of conservation and biodiversity reserve you know, sustainable ecotourism, et cetera, et cetera. Second, I think there is also a huge opportunity to expand our natural assets. This means that we can actually build our natural asset back through reforestation, afforestation, and also agroforestry. There is about 400 million hectares in Asia that is ready to be restored. This degraded land actually presents a huge opportunity for forestry sector to regrow their trees on the landscape. Green jobs in the forestry sector is largely unexplored. As we all know, forestry jobs have many comparative advantages compared to other sectors because it requires low investment and it is often very flexible and adaptable to different situations. I think we have to pursue this. Now I will give two brief examples of FAO works related to green economy. First is what we call assisted natural regenerations, a project that FAO has promoted for at least two decades in the region. ANR is actually a forest restoration approach by actually supporting 
the natural succession of regeneration. Our experience in the Philippines, for example, suggests that ANR is 50% less you know, expensive compared to conventional regeneration. ANR could bring back uh, forest vegetation to the landscape with proper management and planning. The success of ANR also lies in the ability to control fire. In the Philippines, with working with the barangay, the lowest level administrative uh, in the Philippines, 90% of the barangay has been able to control fire. This is important because in the Philippines, government put a lot of uh, millions of dollars for forest rehabilitation only for them to be uh, destroyed by fire subsequently. So the success of this ANR in the Philippines relies on the ownership of the process where people see this as part of their livelihood. Also, they have incentive in restoring landscape because they benefit from it. It was also the case that in the Philippines, we, we, we could find champions and good leadership to support this process. The second project we had in Nepal was leasehold forestry, where poor household were given leases for extended period of 40 years. Communities were handed over bare land or degraded land where they can actually restore to support their livelihood and also to improve their incomes. Experience shows that after six years, ground cover increased from 30% to 90%. Communities started to get income from what they planted on the landscape and, most, uh, and half of these income earners are actually women. It's also evident that time needed to collect fodder, and mostly done by women, has been cut by two and a half hours per day. This is a huge time investment by rural women. And if we can, we can cut this time by having more grasses around the villages and fodders around the villages, I think this is a substantial amount to reduce their uh, time to do this task. So clearly, these two experiences that we have show that we can actually achieve uh, economic, social, and environmental objective at the same time if we do it right. A few things that I would like to leave you behind and to discuss is that, in my view, forestry has a lot to offer in terms of green economy, especially with the renewed interest in forestry given the climate change issues that we are facing at the moment and the role of forest in climate mitigation and adaptation. The essence of green economy in forestry se sector is nothing new. It is back to basics. Let's implement sustainable forest management and explore new ways, uh, opportunities such as green job. We have also to change the way we look at our natural capital like forest. It is not a capital that is free. It is a capital that we borrow from our future generation. And finally, I would like to mention that if we, were, we are serious about green economy, we need supportive regulatory framework. Without this, I think we fail. We, we are doomed to fail for the second time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yudi, for reminding us of um, FAO's long-term work in the region, which illustrates that some of the solutions have been around for some time and maybe need renewed interest and investment can I just uh, call on the second presenter, Ms. Greenberry from ABP. Thank you. Good uh, <coughs> afternoon. My name is Ida Greenberry. I'm a Managing Director of Sustainability of uh, Asia Pulp and Paper Group. My job in my company is basically to engage with stakeholders to develop a long-term sustainable strategy for our business. For anyone who does not know who Asia Pulp and Paper is, we are one of the largest integrated pulp wood, pulp and paper producer in the world, uh, with close to 20 million tons of uh, products of combined capacity per annum. And also we market our products in over 120 countries worldwide. Me. 
I would like to begin um, by focusing on a question posed by the organizers in divining this afternoon's forum. Is it possible to, ex to execute forest management that supports both green growth and poverty reduction? And all of us in this room, I'm sure, agree that our planet to survive, the answer must be a resounding yes, it's possible. Obviously, we will spend the next hour or so discussing it, um, the answer to this question, but please allow me to first share my experience as a business practitioner on my company's journey to implement sustainable forest management that addresses both our need to grow as a business while contributing to Indonesia's development and the reduction of poverty. A sustainable business is one that survives. Sustainable business must be the new business of business as usual. For Asia Pulp and Paper, which is forest dependent, it also needs to exist in a sustainable community and sustainable environment. The support of local communities is important for our operations. APP, as well as our suppliers, we operate in many of Indonesia's uh, remote areas where community development need is very high. Our, our operations impact on the lives of thousands of communities in and around our concession areas, as well as the 50,000 plus of APP employees in Indonesia alone. In many cases, we provide the only source of employment and often are the largest single driver for MDGs in the area. The management of our supplier's plantation forest, protection of neighboring natural forests, as well as the biodiversity contained in it is also a vital element in ensuring that our supplier's plantations are healthy and productive. So what is our approach? This is Asia Baldwin Paper's approach to managing the social and environmental impact of our operations in the landscape. In, Fe <clears throat> in February 2013, we announced our forest conservation policy. As part of the policy, we are committed to zero deforestation in our supply chain. That meant the immediate cessation to all natural forest conversion. We also began some of the largest and most complex higher conservation value and high carbon stock assessment in the world across 38 forest concessions in Indonesia. These assessments, which are nearly complete, will identify areas of high conservation values and tropical forests containing high carbon stock, all of which we have committed to protect and, where possible, enhance. We are also committed to the protection of forested peatland and best practice peatland management in our concessions, the implementation of free, prior, and informed consent or EPIC in our new developments, and to adopt a systematic approach to identifying and resolving social conflicts in and around our supplier's concessions area. We agree to do all this through constant engagement and dialogue with our stakeholders, friends, and critics alike. It's 15 months that, uh, since we announced our forest conservation policy, and for us, a forest conservation policy is not just a policy anymore. It's not just black, written black on white on paper. It's not just a commitment. We are implementing it, and we have been implementing it for over a year. Yes, we encountered many, many challenges in the field. We encountered some, uh, uh, some grievance and also some uh, uh, um, natural forest conversion in our suppliers. It has been a very long and challenging and tiring journey. So I'm standing up here not because I want to um, announce to you or tell you about our commitment, but also share with you what we've done so far for the last 15 months. On top of our zero deforestation policy, we also last week announced an unprecedented unprecedented commitment to conserve and restore 1 million hectares of tropical forest in Indonesia. The initiative was developed with input from many, many stakeholders, such as members of Environmental Paper Network, Greenpeace, and WWF, as well as the Forest Trust. We in Asia Bulb and Paper, we believe that land cannot be conserved or restored in isolation. It must be done on a landscape scale and a wide range of stakeholders, including the community. It must, they must be involved. We hope that by working with Indonesian and international stakeholders, our efforts will be much more effective. 
As an example, our immediate priority is the Bukit Tigapulu landscape in Jambi province in Sumatra. A lot of works have been done to date. We have completed an HCV or high conservation value uh, assessment in the landscape uh, in, inside our concessions and our suppliers' concessions. We found, after so many assessments, we found that the landscape contains vitally important lowland rainforest in and around Bukit Tigapulu National Park. The area has been heavily hit by encroachment, illegal logging, and poaching in recent years, and some of them as an impact from our operations in the past. ABP has three suppliers in that area, operating around the Bukit Tigapulu National Park. These connections position Asia Pulp and Paper as an influential actor in the landscape to help facilitate and encourage landscape scale conservation. The other part of our conservation commitment involves for uh, a free and prior informed consent implementation. So community involvement is an essential element for any conservation effort to succeed. Much of the problem facing forest conservation efforts is forest encroachment, which stems from poverty. ABP and its suppliers and other players in the landscape will have a role in providing employment and contributing to investment in the area. This investment might include financial investment, human resources, and capacity building. All the assessment work we have done to identify higher carbon stock, high conservation value, peat land, social conflict, will all feed into the development of integrated sustainable forest management plans. These management plans, which are currently being developed, will provide the long-term roadmap for how we sustainably manage our concession operations in the context of the regional landscape, so no more individual unit anymore. It, it will also provide a mechanism that ensure these plans are developed with the input of local stakeholders. Our interests lie in protecting our investment and ensuring that we have long-term sustainable raw material supply. We believe this model and approach is unique as it will integrate this interest with those of local communities and the environment. But none of this will be easy, however, but we must remember that Asia Pulp and Paper is just one among the many. We see a number of challenges that can only be addressed by the industry, the government, and civil society working together. What are these challenges? Number one, overlapping concession licenses. This is a common problem in Indonesia, and it has already threatened our moratorium on natural forest clearance. Therefore, as Mr. Frankie Vijaya, chairman of our sister company, GA, said earlier this morning, we fully support the One Map project, and we call for it to be completed sooner rather than later, with full transparency and wide stakeholder consultation process. Challenge number two, forest and pit fires. ABP has been condemning slash and burn activities. We have no burn policy since 1996, aside from representing an economic threat to our business. Fire also challenged our ability to deliver on our forest conservation policy commitment. The only real solution to the forest and pit fire problem is the implementation of truly sustainable landscape management, which includes zero deforestation, protection of forested peat, and best practice in peatland management across Sumatra and beyond. Challenge number three is community rights versus zero deforestation. From our own experience over the last 15 months, we have seen how community land rights can often come into conflict with conservation goals. This is a highly delicate issue, but like it or not, we have to address it if the two are to be reconciled. So what is required? We believe the following is needed. Number one, no deforestation commitment from other actors working in the landscape. Unless our peers, competitors, and governments follow, then this idea will remain as an idea. Point number two, funding and investment. investment. Funds and investments, investment must be channeled into the right project based on transparency, clear funding protocols, and public consultation. Point number three, market recognition. Customers and the market must recognize and reward green investments. Unless the market show recognition for these commitments and progress in, in the implementation, then others will not be incentivized to follow our steps. Uh, 
Next point is a focus on the landscape conservation. We hope that our 1 million hectare commitment outlined earlier will pave the way for a new model for how the private sector working with multiple stakeholders can secure forest protection and sustainability of the landscape in which we operate. And how do we do this? We are optimistic that it is possible to achieve the triple bottom line. We are also realistic in that we are a player amongst many in this journey and we need the engagement and support of many, including those sitting here today. Transparency through MRV or monitoring, reporting and verification is essential. We invite you to follow our progress through our various monitoring platforms such as the dashboard, online dashboard, the Forest Trust uh, public reports and also evaluation report currently undertaken by the Rainforest Alliance. Um, that's all from me. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Greenbury, for illustrating these new but promising commitments and initiatives, which could become examples of private sector uh, involvement uh, if successful. Can I now invite our third speaker, Dr. Hadi Susanto, Pasaribu from Afoko. Thank you. Thank you, Bruno. Um, first of all, I would like to explain about the background of Afoko. It is the uh, Asian Korea Forest Corporation. And then uh, why the Afoko be established? I think the first of all that we What is wrong? Okay. Uh, look at the uh, based on the FIO uh, report that the depletion of the forest resources in Asia is mainly due to the economic development. It was the several reasons that the mining, over-exploitation, agriculture expansion, but all of them that uh, refer to the, how the uh, uh, Asian community using the forest as the one only resource that can be uh, used for uh, the economic development. Uh, according to the data that we had, that data from 2000 until 2010, that almost 0.6 million hectares per year deforestated from the Asian uh, forest. And then, uh, on the other hand, thank you. On the other hand, that the uh, look at the Korea experience on the land degradations, uh, rehabilitations. Uh, Korea has a uh, very have a remarkable achievement on how they uh, effort on the uh, uh, forest rehabilitation. If you look at this Dong uh, uh, area in 1915s, and it takes almost 40 years to become a very nice landscape. On the uh, then also uh, growth in the Jinai, and then also the growing stock from. 1950s, almost uh, from six cubic meter per hectare, it become 220. That's a remarkable achievement for the uh, Korean rehabilitation history. That makes the idea of Korea to propose what they call it the Asian uh, Korea Forest Corporation. In line with the uh, Rock Low Carbon's Green Growth Initiative, the leader of Asian member states and the Republic of Korea welcome. So it was Korea proposal in Jeju in 2009, and then the Asian Forest Cooperation was established uh, at the Bali uh, Asian Summit in 2011. Uh, I would like to uh, take the actual summit that 
statement that we agree to endeavor to strengthen our cooperation in the context of UNFCCC, especially on the red in developing countries, initiative enhancement of sustainable forest management, wasteland restoration, and promotion of industrial forested. So this is in line in the journey of toward the observation of FOCO, a national rock agreement in forest cooperation was signed in November 2011 in Bali. The objective of APOCO is first to facilitate forest cooperation, undertake forest translating sound forest policy, and proven technology into action. So the priority is will be at rehabilitation, reclamation, restoration of ecosystem all link with the poverty alleviation. The first, the second one, they provide a platform for dialogue between Asian member states and the Republic of Korea toward the establishment of the Asian Cooperation Organization. Until now, AFOCO not yet become a international organization. We hope that AFOCO will be international organization in 2016. So, what are the contributions for the uh, AFOCO? So, AFOCO focus on contributing to develop activities related to rehabilitation, reclamation, restoration of degraded ecosystem, and second, strengthening forestry institution and human resources development in tackling the poverty evolution. This is in line with the strategy objective of Asian sociocultural community, blueprint particularly for promoting sustainable forest management and for responding to climate change and addressing its impact. So, so what are APOCO priorities contribute to support the green growth in ASEAN? We do have some project implementing, it's being implemented, that the, our approach is action oriented and country driven focusing on degraded forest link with poverty issues. So we are depending on country proposals. There are three kind of projects that we are launching now. The first we have individual project. From 2011 to date, we have 16 individual projects have been implemented by non-Asian member states. There are from forest restoration, climate change mitigation, biodiversity conservation, and forest and non-forest timber products, and also capacity building. The second one, we have APOCO regional project. The two kind of regional project that we concentrating on, the first that we concentrating in Mekong region, which is water set as an approach that cover Cambodia, Lao PDR, Myanmar, Thailand, and Vietnam. The second one, that other Asian countries. And the third, second project is capacity building on improving forest resources assessment and enhancing the involvement of local communities to address the adverse impact of climate change. The third one, we have AFOCO landmark program, the focus on restoring degraded forests in South Asia through capacity building on forest restoration and sustainable forestry. That consists of four kind of activities. First, establishment of APOCO Regional Education and Training Center that has been decided in Myanmar. And the second one, development education and training program for capacity building. They are all four Asian member states. The third, restoration of degraded forest region that will be covered Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam, and the fourth one, developing of advocating activities that will be implemented by the all Asian member state. So, what are the new approach and why? Actually, uh, uh, from my slide, we have learned in Korea what they call it, Semalundong, which is new community development. If you look at the slide, there are four look at the process 
of how Korean rehabilitation implemented in the field. Land preparation, it was 1950s. And then it started a new restoration initial. And the interesting one is that uh, commitment of leadership. This slide show how President Park directly see the activities on the field. And the last one, how these rehabilitation activities changing the landscape. So what we learn from Simalundong, which is new community movement, is was connect cornerstone of national modernization and considered as a spiritual culture that I encourage people with active participation. This Simalondo also has been adopted by the UN as an official program to eradicate poverty across under the development world. So the last my slide is that what we have learned from Korea Green Road activities that Korea is what believe the rapid growth of Korea is often attributed to the success of the Shemarondong under the spirit of diligence, self-help, and cooperation. Second one, green growth need to develop into a broad social movement. It needs public support, whether mandatory or voluntary. The third one, green growth deal with fundamental change in growth paradigm is not only just a concept. Prioritizing quality of life against massive consumption of fuel is the foundation of to achieve sustainable economic green growth. Last one, that green growth require strong institutional setup through which policies that will establish a model for green growth development. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for highlighting these elements of what I would call local initiatives. Um, this initiative, of course, originates from serious problems in the ASEAN forests and its forest sectors. Um, but it also shows that there is clear government commitment in this region to tackle the problems of the forestry sector in a wider kind of context of green economy. Can I now invite our last speaker, uh, Mr. Adam Grant from New Forest Asia. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Um, thank you to C4 and FAO for inviting New Forest to come and speak uh, at this conference. Um, what I'd like to cover today um, is trying to look at what New Forest's is um, and then look at the institutional money that's going into forestry, how that is changing rapidly at the moment um, and where we're probably going to see that going in the future and then what that means um, towards forestry globally uh, specific, but specifically because um, the area we're working in here is Southeast Asia and, and the potential impact institutional money may have on the, the timber trade. Don't want to ask for lawyers, all right. Um, so, overview of New Forest, who we are. New Forest started in 2005, so it's been going for eight years. Uh, our remit, we manage forests for our uh, institutional clients, these institutional clients in the US, in Europe, um, and elsewhere, mainly the, the pension funds. Um, currently, we have $2 billion worth of uh, timberland under our control. Uh, that's $2 billion invested of institutional money. Uh, we have 43 employees. Uh, our offices are in Singapore, uh, that's where I'm based, uh, running a new fund called uh, TAF. Um, and then we have uh, the office, our head office in Sydney. We're based in Sydney, it's an Australian company, but we also have operations and uh, offices in San Francisco, which run our mitigation banking, um, 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 which I'll, I'll touch on in a slide later. Um, that $2 billion worth of investment equates to just over uh, 500,000 hectares of forest under our management at the moment. Um, at the moment, uh, so far, we've been generating decent returns for the institutional clients. 
what we think differentiates us from the other TMOs, which uh, if we're going to call ourselves a TMO because we're based down here, um, is that we're based in Sydney. We have the office in Singapore, which gives us access to the Southeast Asian market. There's no other TMOs that are operating down here solely. Most are based up in uh, Europe or in the United States. Uh, we're the largest forest owner in Australia and New Zealand. Um, our whole ethos and the way the, uh, the company was created is around sustainability. Um, every forest, every investment we have, we have to get certified. Um, our aim is to get FSC certified. And we, uh, from acquisition, uh, we have three years to actually achieve that. Um, and we engage uh, readily in, uh, with NGO sector. Um, we're part of the World Economic Forum Global Council, Aspen Institute and, and others. So we're, we're connected in, we're talking to the civil society, uh, we also have the institutional money and our whole remit is sustainability. If we go quickly flip on to what institutional um, investment, where the market is at the moment, there's growing interest in institutional investment. Here, here's the growth. Um, in millions of hectares, uh, you've got the US, but then we can flip into the global area and institutional money as a hedge um, for these pension funds is becoming uh, of more interest. Uh, we can put some figures on that. Um, we, we're talking about in the US and Canada about 85 billion, uh, New Zealand is around seven or eight, and then Brazil is the next biggest, Brazil, Uruguay, and Chile. And then here in Asia and, and over in Africa, there's eight billion invested. But if you look at, start looking at the other commodities and you've got uh, oil palm and rubber where institutional money also sits that's about 150 billion in this region the interesting part of this is the the, the markets or in the US in Australia and Europe they're very mature the opportunities for investment are drying up they've already they've already invested so now the institutional money is starting to look at the emerging markets and we're seeing more money coming to Africa and we're seeing a lot more interest in Southeast Asia and that's why uh, we have our, our new fund which is uh, recently closed out uh, and we're based in Singapore trying to invest that money in Southeast Asia. Um, there's a few TMOs that have worked here in the region in the past uh, and we're actually set now in, in Singapore and we're concentrating wholeheartedly in trying to invest uh, the money of TAF which is just closed out in June last year at 170 million. So the Tropical Asia Forest Fund, TAF, is uh, our new fund. As I say, it's 170 million, closed in June. Uh, we have first and second tier countries which are interested in this region. Uh, our first uh, areas of operation will be Indonesia, Malaysia, and Vietnam. We've got our first acquisition in Sabah, uh, Malaysia, and we're looking at uh, different op opportunities for acquisitions in Indonesia, Vietnam, China, um, and Laos at the moment. As so we're based in Singapore, and our, our whole remit is environmental, social, and governance factors. Um, we are looking at greenfield, but we're also looking at established plantations. The, th the thesis for TAF is looking at the forestry within Southeast Asia, which is changing dramatically. You know, I've only got 10 minutes to speak, but we've got many, many graphs showing how forestry in Asia is changing from, in the past, it's been natural forest exploitation, uh, which has given you know, low-cost timber to the market. But th th those areas now are getting harder to use, harder to cut, the costs are getting greater. So the market is changing dramatically and very quickly to plantations, uh, fast growing, high quality uh, plantation management. And that's the thesis for TAF, that we invest in these new areas, either greenfield or established plantations, um, looking at probably distressed plantations, improve the management, have them certified, look at new commodities within these plantations, look at uh, carbon, look at biodiversity, um, and, and different ways we can package, package the plantations up, improve them. Um, and then our exit strategy uh, from investment acquisition to exit is about 10 years. Um, it's a, a TAF and all the other funds within New Forest are closed funds. That means we gain uh, uh, control and interest in any plantation, uh, any um, forest that we actually acquire, and that means um, we do have a lot more control over what we're going to do over some other investors. It means we can get certified. You know the, the issues around some of the aspects of FSC. If you get control and interest, allows us to get certified, um, and it allows us lower discount rates if we're actually taking control and interest. 
as I said, the efforts um, for new forests. We have a very strong social environmental management system. This is a requirement of the institutional money. Um, we have to get certified. We have to have a decent, decent social environmental management system. Our limited partners, the, the pension funds, audit us regularly and we have to actually meet these thresholds for responsible investment. Um, uh, most of this is going also into greenhouse gas emissions, climate change. As we're looking at different aspects of the forest management plantations, not straight uh, timber, um, uh, timber sales and then flipping the, the plantation, but we're also looking at how we can package that up into carbon biodiversity. Biodiversity credits, this is something that we're trying. This is um, new forests. Um, we have the, the market in the United States for mitigation banking is, is a big market. Uh, mitigation banking, if, if you're aware of it, is, uh, you know, if, you're gonna, if Walmart or IKEA want to put in a big retailing outlet in the United States and then they have to put it in an environmentally sensitive area, then they can mitigate through a bank elsewhere. Um, being set up by different funds and this is a big part of our business in the United States is setting up mitigation banking. So we've tried to bring that into Southeast Asia. Um, in the Malawa Biobank we've set this up in Sabah. It's been running for about six or seven years. Um, it's been a struggle for us but this is something that New Forest has been very interested in. We set up our own fund to fund this um, and with the, the partnership with Cyber Forestry Department, we've managed to secure 34,000 hectares of um, already logged over forest. We secured that, made it class one um, reserve, um, and now we're selling the biodiversity credits and we're looking to get the carbon onto this as well to try and lock this up, protect it, to show that you can protect an area, you can mitigate, but you can also make a return on those areas. And that return, a percentage of the returns go back into a trust to manage the area in perpetuity. Um, so. It's been a labor of love for us at the, so far. We're probably a bit ahead of the curve on this, so there hasn't been a lot of interest. Um, but we're, trying to, we're starting to see a growing interest in mitigation banking in the marketplace right now. So we're gonna plug away and see if, see if this will actually fly. My last slide is just some of the lessons learned um, we've seen and you know, we've all discussed this. I've seen it's discussed in um, different uh, sessions already. Um, the lessons we're seeing is for much of the work, the environmental green economy and how you can improve forest management through institutional money or the market. The first one is price signals. Um, you know, the European Emissions Trading Scheme, um, it had a lot of potential because there was good price signals in the market and people are interested. Um, and so that's why it, it grew quite quickly at the beginning. I'll get into it what happened to it later on. Uh, the US mitigation, as I say, that's, that's about a $3 billion market in the US right now just doing mitigation um, because it has good price signals. It's allowed people to actually invest in different regions and, and mitigate and, and invest back into the forest industry. Uh, certification, you know, the, the, you, we can argue whether there's a premium and what that means, uh, but we're also seeing market access. So market access gives us a premium. If we're modeling a forest, that market access allows us to get into the European and the US markets, which probably would, would be a bit more difficult for us to get into, especially with FLECT, you know, the VPA, European Timber Regulation, LACI, all of these different regulations in the marketplace. It's, it's closing off markets for a lot of the, the product coming out of these plantations. So that allows us to get some sort of premium and, and model that. The financial investment sector, you know, it's, it's, you, you saw the, the billions of dollars that's already in the, the forest industries and the, the potential is greater for a, a lot more money and uh, the institutional money to come in. Um, and so the, the markets can, through that we can create transparency, uh, the pricing, we're seeing futures and options uh, through the futures and options which we market to the, offer to the market, that offers st stability. Um, investments funds created around the EU, EUTS and others. There was a lot of interest and funds have come in. And this is why you know, New Forest is only eight years old, but uh, we have $2 billion worth of, of land under our control already because there's funds out there, they're interested in investing in these areas. Um, they, they see there is potential and they see it, it's, it's a great st stable investment for them. It's a hedge for them on, the, on more of their other riskier investments. 
uh, and get onto that stability is necessary. Um, as you saw, there were the EU e ETS, the, the, there was no st stability at that. It started off, it was looking great, then the market got flooded, uh, and the industry can't really invest, they can't model what they want to do and invest on plantations, they can't invest to pay into, um, offer credits back into these markets if there's no stability. And then it needs to cost more to remain outside uh, than rather inside a scheme. You know, the lack of meaningful price premium for voluntary certifications has hampered people's getting in. But I think the market, the way it's changing with the, the regulations, um, is helping uh, FSC, it's probably PFC, for people to try and get market access now. They're, even though you know, a lot of these regulations say FSC isn't a requirement of, of the law, but it does help. Um, it, it, it reduces your risk, so it's all about risk mitigation. And so th this, sort of, this helps if you're starting to invest and look at plantation. So not to get involved in these schemes is a very, very difficult prospect to actually get institutional money. It's very difficult to uh, model, and it's very difficult to um, show growth over a long term if you're not going to do this. Red, you know, I've touched on that, that we're doing carbon on, on many of the different areas where we're trying to do carbon. You know, red has struggled um, because there's been no stability at all within the red market, and it's very difficult for the private sector to get involved um, without this stability, uh, without showing that it, you, it's actually going to give you something in the long term to start getting involved. Once red starts looking like it will turn a profit for the private sector, they'll get involved. But right now, everyone's sitting back as everyone else is to see what happens with that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for this comprehensive presentation which shows how complex investments can, can be and in fact how much untapped potential there seems to be in, here in Asia for highly scrutinized investment funds. Um, we are now done with our series of presentations. Um, we have about half an hour left for discussions. Uh, can I please invite people from the floor to ask any direct questions to our presenters or to provide any general inputs on the subjects and especially with the focus on, on the objectives of this um, event which is the identification of policy development and research needs in the area of, of green growth and, and landscape approaches. Please, yes, from, if you can just briefly introduce yourself. Uh, thank you. <coughs> my name is Chirawat. <coughs> Hello, my name is Chirawat. I'm from Thailand, the Thai Timber Association. I'd like to address to Dr. Yerdi on the green economy. I just came back from the conference in the U.S. on the Sustainable Furnishing Council and they are so afraid of using wood, so they decide to change from wood to aluminum and plastic because they believe it is greener. So I think because we are promoting the green economy, somehow we drive the whole industry to such a way that they are so scared of the wood. And right now promoting the plastic and aluminum industry, which is actually wrong because wood is supposed to be the greenest material in the, in the, in the world, but we didn't address that uh, well enough that the, the non, uh, uh, no background people will be so scared. I think wood is still the only one that can actually ex sustain and expand the natural resources, but the other material cannot. So how can we uh, improve this promotion? I look into the way you conclude. Still didn't address this issue, so I'd like to request you to look into this, how to promote the green uh, economy by not just uh, uh, focusing on one timber or one product but not addressing the other product because it signaled the wrong indication to the world somehow this could be a bad toward the green economy instead of just uh, helping the green economy that's how I feel and I have one question to Dr. to Mr. Mr. Adam on the uh, I like the idea on the on the tough and because it's a new forest and uh, investing in a new forest is very interesting it's the new idea that actually investment opportunity is a new idea. But I wonder why not Thailand included in the in the diagram in the in the map? 
Because I think so far for the last many years, Thailand has been investing on the uh, rubber wood plantation and we become the biggest exporter of sawn timber of rubber wood. I mean, on one single-handed product. But I like to promote the diversity in Thailand because we cannot just rely on one single species. More diverse species could be very beneficial. And I think the scheme like this should be a very good example for Thailand as well. So I'd like you to uh, <laughs> look into this one and let me know why Thailand is not included. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yodi? You want, you want my mic? There's another one there. Thank you very much for the question, Mr. Jirawat. I think uh, a green economy doesn't mean that we have to avoid using timber. Uh, in my personal view, and I think it has been written widely that, you know, forest is probably, um, you know, among the greener, you know, sectors because all resources in forests are renewable. I think uh, the key challenge in forest and forest is really um, how can we strengthen, strengthen the communication aspect of forestry. We all acknowledge that foresters are not a good communication or good communicators. I think key messages have to go to be conveyed to stakeholder in such a way that you know, the messages are taken, uh, are received in, you know, in its uh, right way. Actually, uh, using alternative to timbers might not necessarily greener than using timber. If you look at the alternative product like plastics, cement, uh, or concrete, or whatever, they probably would have more carbon footprint compared to timber, because timber is actually, if we manage sustainably, it's actually uh, you know, more, uh, uh, have less uh, carbon pr footprint compared to others. So I think it's uh, our collective task in actually trying to convey to, to the world that you know, how can we actually uh, strengthen sustainable forest management to support the whole concept of green economy. Uh, yeah, the countries I first pointed out were our tier one. Um, those were how we structured uh, the creation of TAF with the institutional clients. Um, these are the areas of the interest for them. And they were the, the countries we saw that probably were the lower risk, if you like, or the more potential for investment. And then we have a whole raft of tier two under those uh, countries if, it's not, um, if we're not able to invest there or if we see potential in those countries. And Thailand is one of the tier two countries. So if you've got a... Um, if you've got a contact or something you want to invest in, then please give me a ring and then we'll go have a look at it. So I can give you the phone number later. But we have a gentleman on, on the left. Please introduce yourself. Thank you. Thank you. I am Togu Manurung from Bogor Agricultural University, Faculty of Forestry. I'd like to address my uh, questions and comment to Dr. Hadi Pasaribu. I really amaze to learn about Korean experience, especially in rehabilitating the degraded land area in Korea back in 1950s, so that we have what we just saw in the pictures that you show us. Now here in Indonesia, we had such a huge area, degraded land area. The number, only the Almighty God knows, more, maybe more than 40 million hectares altogether. So, I would like really to see this happen in Indonesia. And given the fact that you are Indonesian, as the director, executive director of AFOCO, it would be best, or what should I say, if you could really make this happen in Indonesia with this opportunity from AFOCO. And I'm sure it could be done. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, actually, I'm not Korean. Uh, just learning that the one, what I have seen in Korea is that the spiritual, spirits of cooperation. If you look at these last 40 years, 
the history of land rehabilitation processes in Korea. It is just the commitment of leaderships. So you write that uh, in Indonesia and other countries that it needs a, a leadership. Of course, that we cannot adopt 100% of Samarindong, new community movement from Korea and translate it to other Asian countries. But what we have learned is that the spirit of cooperation, leaderships, and diligence. That's the, that's the thing that we are trying to uh, make things happen. One of the university in Korea, Yongnam University, that is a graduate program on Shimanundong. At this time, there's almost 48 graduates program from all over the world. Now, learn how Shimanundong is developed. And I think some countries in Africa and also in Asia has been adopted the system. And some of them are really shown successful and some of them still need to adjust because adapting the cultures is not as easy as adapting the technology. So we hope that with this, uh, what do you call it, with this, the uh, examples of changing the, like I said, that green growth is not a concept. It is the changing the attitude, changing the fundamental ways of life. So that is very important for, for, for ours for the next future. Thank you. At the back. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Will McFarn from the Overseas Development Institute in London. Um, quite a lot of you mentioned uh, quite broadly investment and financing. Adam was quite specific and talked about how there was a need for capital investment in plantations as you move away from a model that um, kind of use, use natural forests. And I wondered if some of the other speakers might talk a bit more about the finance and investment challenges that they have, whether that's capital expenditure, operating expenditure, whether there was a need for you know, investment in research, or kind of what the exact kind of challenge they face. Um, and I'm just interested because um, looking to try and kind of piece together you know, on the ground finance and investment challenges with you know, kind of opp opportunities and um, you know, finance that might be out there. Thanks. Good question. Uh, in line with the objectives of the, the event, um, was the question directed to Adam? I think it's actually directed to everyone except Adam. Um, yeah, everybody, maybe Adam wants right. to kind of ex expand on what he said, but I wondered if the other other speakers could talk about the, their finance and investment challenges. Well, we have one more private sector person. Maybe you, you want to answer. What are the challenges you're facing in, in your greener in investments in uh, APP? I think I, I clearly outlined the challenges that we, are, uh, we have been facing to date. Um, majority of the challenges were, are actually in the, uh, the social conflict, the land tenure, tenure um, not, you know, the, the unclarity of the, uh, of, the, of the mapping. So all of this mix into one. Um, I, for, for the mapping, I, we, we are, as I said, we are fully supporting the one map program by the government and we're trying to support with the transparency of our supply chain and everything else so it can be mapped out properly. Um, regarding the social conflicts uh, with the implementation of free and prior in, informed consent and the cascading social conflict resolution procedure, we try to address that as well. Um, Capacity building internally and also the the community around us. Um, what else? I think I think those those three are, are the top three. Um, is that does that answer your question? Sorry, I wasn't really clear about the question. Thanks. Please, next question. 
Good afternoon, Yama Siddiqui, Office Depot. I'll ask the gentleman from Korea um, about the financing model for Samuel Londong and whether the, the, the long-term project was funded exclusively by the Korean government or whether there were multiple investors. And by extension, if Indonesia were to adopt that model, would, it, would your recommendation be to incorporate private sector capital uh, in executing a national program? What would your approach be? Uh, thank you, as far as I say. I think say, what you asked is whether there is special investment for. As far as I know, that Samalandong is not a, uh, I think it's the fully uh, people participation. So they, the government does only uh, provide the seedling and access to the forest. So a community itself doing through cooperation and leadership. So that's the, I'm sorry, is that, is that answer your question? I, I think it does. So no, no government funding on a national basis. No, uh, this is not a project activities. This is a really uh, mass movement of the community. So the, 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 the government just only uh, mobilize, mobilize the community power and go plan trees hand by hand. So uh, if, you, if you look at this, this the real movie of Shumalandong, it's, it's uh, remarkable. I mean, the uh, all communities that uh, just uh, committed themselves, go to the hilly mountain bear lands and then bring their seedling and then watering them, guard by themselves. So there's no uh, intensive, uh, what do you call it, the investment by the government, except for the infrastructure, like housings and then roads, systems, uh, village roads, I mean, not, not the, the toll roads, something like that. Thank you. Yes, please, on the left. Hello. So my name is Fabrina Sugianto. I'm from the Faculty of Medicine, University of Indonesia. So I'd like to address this question to Ms. Aida. So um, the green economy that is being implemented by APP, it requires uh, the market, the cooperation from the market. But all the market wants is uh, the products with cheapest price and highest quality. And as we know, green products are tend to be more expensive compared to the normal products. And uh, what I'd like to ask is, how are you going to tackle this problem? And what what APP has been done for the past 15 months in order to make this uh, this uh, green economy to be successful in the in implementation. Thank you. Um, the, in the last 15 months, if uh, if I could share the the most important things that we've done to ensure that uh, it actually got implemented and um, successful was um, just patience and never give up. Everything is possible, changing the culture internally, uh, also externally, keep talking, keep explaining the same things to everybody internally and externally. Just, you know, um, I guess like Bahari said you, before, you know, it's about leadership internally and externally. It's about changing culture. And that cannot be bought and cannot be pushed by anybody. So that's, I think, the most important thing that we've done in the last uh, uh, 15 months. And then regarding the market recognition and pricing, we, we are thinking, we have been thinking that we probably could do it the other way around. Uh, maybe we could ask uh, customers, our customers, to help us uh, support our efforts in different ways, probably based on uh, cost-related marketing. Because uh, to be honest, to be honest, REDD is not really is not really a clear target right now. Yes, we're still going toward that, but uh, is a carbon uh, carbon credit and CR actually worth uh, uh, worth pursuing? 
um, maybe not yet at this stage, but we're still going that way, but maybe we can involve the, the customers and the market uh, in a cost-related marketing to uh, provide a percentage of our sales into the forest protection. That's something that uh, we have in, in, in our mind and, and is one, is one of our, our ideas as well. Thank you. Yes, at the back. Um, I'm Suisat from uh, Myanmar. I'm working with Action Aid. Um, I just want to ask um, the Korean model to send you down again. Um, and you are saying that pretty much completely with community commitment and uh, mobilization. And I just wonder how do you keep the mobilization, participation of the people uh, for the long run? Uh, and I understand that you, uh, this program is running in Myanmar and in dry zone, which is getting drier, water sources are getting dry. And where, I mean, which, this program is running in Myanmar and why don't you go and get, build up a model in, in dry zone area? Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, as uh, I mentioned that the uh, our focal investments they focus on three, two aspects, rehabilitations and restoration reclamation, and the second one is capacity building. Why in Myanmar, uh, we fully understand that among Asian countries, there are uh, some countries that need develop in their human resources. So that's why we, we decided that among ASEAN countries that we agreed to establish the training centers in Myanmar, which is uh, uh, it's not only the uh, train for the farmers or uh, level, but we do have uh, what we call it the uh, degree programs for uh, next five years we will have uh, 10 PhD degrees and then uh, 20 master degrees from uh, Asian countries, but this is our special focus on, on uh, uh, Laos, uh, PDR, and Vietnam, and Myanmar. So uh, why is that? Because we do understand that, that these two countries need uh, uh, more uh, attention to improve their human uh, capacity compared to other A Asian member states. I think maybe the, we will have to summarize a little bit at the end, but one more question on the left, maybe second last question. I have one as well, so if you allow me. I think you only allowed one, <laughs> but colleagues from from Vietnam, yes, yes, Lin, yes, please. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my name is Lian, and uh, I work for the Center for Education and Development. I would like to learn a little bit more about Korean experience on how uh, on cooperations uh, for environment protection. Because like in Vietnam, we have, uh, we have a lot of strategy, policy to sustainable development on how to balance social development, environment protection, and economics uh, development. But when it comes to reality, environment protection always go to losing aim. And, uh, and also, the, we have a lot of overlapping between the government ministry, for instance, uh, the Ministry of Environment and National Resource and uh, Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development. And so we would like to know more, a little bit more about how to use strengthen cooperation among different actors for sustainable development in South Korea and how you are going to, tra to transfer that kind of experience to other Asian countries. Thank you. 
Uh, thank, thank you very much. The, as we understand that Korea has not yet been listed as Annex 1, but they are the one that the first announced and have committed to the green growth. And what, uh, what the new policies from Korea is now is that to give incentive to the old company that using this, uh, what you call it, wood pallet, yeah, instead of uh, uh, energy, uh, fuel energy, they're using wood pallet. And um, uh, government of Korea giving subsidized, uh, fully subsidized for all, uh, uh, what do you call it, the uh, Korean company that has initiative to build their uh, wood pallet energy. The question is that the, the, uh, in Korea itself, there's not enough land to develop this kind of thing. So that's why a lot of Korean companies go to the Asian countries looking for the area for rehabilitation and then build their industries for, for uh, wood pallet energy. That, that kind of this uh, uh, new policy from how to develop uh, uh, what you call it, uh, green roads, economy, uh, something like that. I think that's the last question before my last question at the back. Okay, thank you for the opportunity given to me. I want to address my question to panelists from uh, the APP, Asia Pulp and Paper. Uh, my name is Steve Harrison. I'm Indonesian representative uh, in the Asia Youth Climate Network. Uh, my question is, uh, is there any specific community development program or social empowerment projects uh, around, the, around the forest that uh, APP operating? Uh, because regarding the issue of um, a sustainable forest management and corporate social responsibility. I know that uh, APP is credible company to to uh, to make it uh, happen. So, uh, what the APP has been done for uh, for for that? Thank you. Um, yes, uh, it's, it's actually quite a lot. Before we started the implementation of free and prior informed consent. Uh, and its cascading social conflict resolutions. We adopted uh, uh, MDG, uh, Millennium Development Goals, uh, and develop a matrix to develop our CSR and community empowerment programs. Uh, we also refer to the standard for the uh, uh, CSR ISO standard as well. So what, how we did it is basically we measure our social footprint across our operations, and then uh, from the social footprints, we analyze what are the gaps and we talk to the to the uh, affected community how to close those gaps using the uh, the metrics that we develop uh, using the uh, MDG. So we have done quite a lot, but uh, we also understood that by doing those alone were, were not enough. So uh, we uh, um, expanded our uh, community development and community environment program to also. Uh, adopting free and prior informed conflict and social conflict resolution because once you have a conflict, uh, it cannot be solved or resolved by by providing um, op job opportunity or providing uh, um, road or, or or schools or something. Yeah, so it's got to be the, the the core of the conflicts must be resolved first. So by combining those uh, social conflict re resolutions, free and prior informed concept, concept, and also goals going MDG, I believe that the rate of success is much higher. Thank you. So I, I do have a last question to our private sector colleagues. What I see in, in landscapes, you have a spectrum of different stakeholders from smallholders to large corporations that are driving the changes in our forest landscapes or are the architects of our forest landscapes. The development agencies, for example FAO, and we had some of, some of the examples of what we do, are often on the small scale, on the smallholders end of that spectrum. And then you have larger corporations or investment funds who look into larger investments. They want volume. They want 
to be able to, to invest in, in larger sections of the landscape. The question is, do we have enough information about, about these smaller scale investments or interventions that could be upscaled through these larger uh, corporations or, or funds? Because of course there is an opportunity to have private investments in these smaller scale interventions, supporting these smaller scale interventions that are more, often more poverty alleviation oriented. So first of all, is there enough information? Is this already happening? Is there enough information about this? And would the private sector welcome this kind of research in the forestry sector? I think, Adam, you have to answer the question first. Um, yeah, sure, there's, there's appetite. Um, and you know, some of the areas we look at is uh, community, um, in, uh, communities are involved. Uh, you've always got the problem. It's not necessarily an investment in the landscape or a larger landscape. It's what, what that landscape is developing. You know, it's the quality and the quantity um, that can come out of a community forest. Um, but the, there is potential. You know, we're looking at areas in China that are community-owned, um, which we can amalgamate and create into a larger block and still use and, and work with the communities. Um, if there was, you know, Recoft and others are doing great work on this and there's been a lot of information already out there, so it's available to us. Um, it's, it's just, you know, back to the question of the gentleman up in the back is, you know, what, what's, the diff what, what's the the barriers to investment? You know, even if you have institutional money behind you burning a hole in your back pocket, it's still very difficult to invest here. Um, that the risks are high, uh, the hurdle rate you have to reach is, is quite high for forestry um, because of those risks. Um, and then you have competing opportunity land costs, uh, you know, oil palm or, or maybe it's a forest management that isn't necessarily working or selling into the markets to acquire the due diligence required for some of the institutional money coming out of Europe. So um, if there is information, we can always use better and more information, and there is potential for working with communities. Um, it's just, as you say, scaling them up, but also getting the quality of the product out of the forest. Um, sure, as it's, it's always, I'd, first, I don't think there are enough informations out there, for, if you're talking about Indonesia. Um, secondly, yes, learning from what has been done in smaller holders is a good idea. But thirdly, I'm sorry, but trying to be, I'm, I'm a, bit, a bit pessimistic over here. Uh, I don't think you can actually use the, the concept that you implement in smallholders and then try to make it big and uh, at, the, at the landscape level. Because like I said earlier, um, any programs, uh, especially forest protection, cannot be done in isolations uh, away from what happened in the other, <coughs> the other part of the, of the landscape. So. If you, if, you, if, you, if the agency would like to have a, a more sustainable project or program or initiative, um, that have to be done in a landscape level, not really any smaller than that or any smallholders. Smallholders can be part of the bigger landscape uh, program, but you have to look at both small and also landscape level. That's the only way to be sustainable, I think. Thank you. I think we have, we are now closing um, or getting close to the closure of this session. Can I just ask Dr. Doris Capistrano to maybe summarize key points, potential topics for research and policy development, and maybe next steps or recommendations for the organizers of, the, of this event? Thank you. Thank you, Bruno. And um, thank you for the opportunity not only to summarize, but hopefully also inject some um, issues that perhaps may not have come out very clearly uh, from the discussion, if you would allow me. And do remind me if I'm running out of time. Uh, just to go, uh, just to remind ourselves in terms of the key questions for this session. First is forest and green growth, which is the role of forest management in this new context and the new concept that also leads to poverty reduction. To what extent is this feasible and what are the approaches and current practices? Second has to do with a suite of issues related to green investment 
and benefits for people? How can forestry practices and investments be greener? And, I would, and how can they increase benefits for people? I would translate that into how can forest investments be not only greener, but also more, the benefits more equitably shared? The third is the outlook for ASEAN's forests, and I understand my task to also reflect on what this might mean for ASEAN. And uh, going forward, what the agenda might be, not only for ASEAN, but in general for research, uh, investment, and capacity building. With that in mind, let me just remind ourselves of the presentations and the key messages as I understood them. You have the presentations before you as well and, and uh, downloadable. Dr. Yurdi Yasmi reminded us that sustainable forest management does have a lot to offer to this concept of green economy. A lot of it already exists. A lot of this we already know how to do. A lot of this the international community has worked on in various levels of detail, including very detailed indicators, monitoring protocols, and cooperation agreements that exist, including, for example, AFOCO that has been presented in this panel. However, what is, uh, uh, but he also uh, reminds us that what we need to do is to be able to also talk about uh, and build on previous lessons, for example, reduced impact logging, the role of certification, and other um, uh, approaches such as assisted natural re regeneration that are not only techni technologically demonstrated but also have proven to be beneficial at various levels. And he also indicated that, and a number of issues uh, related to that discussion also uh, require some flexibility in the approaches. And um, I'd flag the issue of fire control, which is key to successful regeneration, a technical issue. But also, I know from based on experience, also has been a source of conflict in many uh, locations and a major factor in climate change mitigation and adaptation. Within ASEAN, there is also a cooperation agreement that deals with uh, fire, fire control, haze, uh, pollution control at the regional level. So for ASEAN, this is, this is an issue as well. The role of forest and climate change was something that you already talked about and uh, provided quite a bit of examples and, and figures associated with that. The presentation from APP talked about an initiative that is relatively new, only about one and a half years uh, in the making. As I understood it also from the question and answer, a lot of this really has been changing people's minds and cultures and ways of looking at things, both internally and within the communities in which they work. From my understanding, also from the responses, a lot of this had to do with managing conflicts, looking at um, clarifying uh, the basis for the relationships, free prior informed consent protocols, and levels of assessment. There was a, pres a, a mention of a major commitment, a fairly major commitment from uh, a, a very influential company, and that is the commitment to um, uh, for zero deforestation and a commitment to conserve and restore one million hectares of rainforest in nine priority landscapes in Indonesia. Um, at least from my understanding, a lot of this is still in the very early stages, and I'm sure that there's quite a bit of interest as well uh, based on questions from the floor on how this will unfold. From the question and answer, uh, Ms. Greenberry alluded to a number of challenges that would be um, determining in terms of the success of these initiatives. On many occasions, she mentioned social conflict and how to deal with this. There are also um, questions about how exactly you uh, begin to roll out um, initiatives in cases where tenure and rights are contested. I think uh, land tenure was mentioned as a major source of conflict and the need to be able to not only deal with the root causes, as she calls them, of these conflicts before you even begin to uh, take steps forward in terms of uh, implementation as well as conservation uh, in the way that has been committed to. Uh, major issues re uh, are not unusual in places where they work, illegal logging, forest encroachment, 
but also the fact that there are many other actors, influential actors in the landscape. And for companies like APP, it is not only a commitment from their part, but one of the key challenges is perhaps to up the bar, to raise the bar for all other co business competitors that hopefully would also commit to such an approach. So I think um, one issue here is for uh, private sector that are venturing into new territories, trying to be uh, environmentally responsible, socially responsible, how do you then not lose competitive advantage? That, that is how I would phrase it. And how do you then bring along and expand the community and the pool of enlightened businesses so that collectively you make change happen on the ground? I think that, that is the one way I would phrase it. There were a number of examples that were cited and places also where uh, these initiatives are being implemented. The third presentation on AFOCO, uh, the ASEAN um, co Forestry Cooperation between ASEAN and Korea, a lot of information on the context for a deforestation in ASEAN, the basis for the interest of, of Korea in promoting this approach, um, the kinds of programs and cooperation activities that are being supported. But what seems to have taken and, and captured the interest of the audience is how exactly this new community movement, Saimul Undong, works. There were a number of questions about what it is, who's driving it, who's funding it, and how it is that you sustain interest in this movement. Um, my understanding, if I might inject a little bit of what I understand this movement to be, is that its, it's success, correct me Pahadi if I'm wrong, its success really rested on a very clear and very strong linkages from a centrally controlled, centrally driven political agenda from a strong government, uh, as well as and building on a tradition of grassroots democracy and local decision making on the ground. It also happened at the time when Korea was uh, expanding into an industrialization so that there was a little bit of a transfer from the urban sector to the rural sector. So investment was happening mediated through the national government down through the local governments but supported through funds funneled from one sector to another. And the reason I raised that is because it has implications for how in the future we would be financing investments in the green economy. There were a number of questions raised from Adam's presentation and examples of how new forests uh, actually manage um, investments uh, f based on sustainable forest management. And this is perhaps, to me anyway, one of the novel uh, practical approaches that seem to have worked. I was very struck by the figures that was presented. Rates of return of 6 and 6.5% for USA and Canada region, but what, 10 to 18% uh, for Asia and Africa, and I understand from Southeast Asia, the rate of return for this kind of socially responsible investing is around 12%. If that is the case, the business case for responsible investment perhaps have already been demonstrated and has already been made. Indeed, um, the literature and the experience from an analysis from, from this uh, body of, of experiences shows that investment in forestry and sustainable forest management is a very good way of diversifying one's portfolio because it also tends to not only have great returns but also social and environmental payoffs as well and that makes it quite attractive. There were a number of examples that were presented and also directions um, moving forward in terms of what might be growth points, including, for example, capitalizing on carbon value and how uh, the direction of red and red markets could, in fact, potentially grow the potential for green investing based on sustainable forest management. Let me just say that, I, I, just a note, that, um, and this is perhaps a research gap that could be looked at in the future. When we talk about investing, we normally talk about funds, credit, and the kinds of assets that are injected from the input side. A very important, based on you know, a lot of experience from, from a small scale uh, community based mobilization, is that there is a, a major need for the invisibles, investing in the invisibles and the enabling conditions that would make an investment viable, institutional development and institutional growth. One of the factors mentioned here was leadership as critically important. 
And also, empowerment was a word that was mentioned, and institutional strengthening was a word that was mentioned. But perhaps what needs to be done is to review the literature, the knowledge, and in the context of a landscape level, because this tends to be very sectoral in the way this data and information has been analyzed, what it might mean when you also have to negotiate and renegotiate across components of the landscape. How do you actually do this? And for those colleagues who will be looking at research at the landscape level, I would urge, at least from my side, research that would build on existing knowledge, and there's quite a bit, from the integrated rural development experience, the watershed management experience, community forestry from different parts of the world, and how that could actually be used to manage uh, more, sustain more sustainable landscapes and create viable investments. A number of questions, and I would like to thank uh, Bruno for this last question, has to do with community forests and how um, this might actually be a component of a green growth and green economy into the future. And how, based on the response, I think an issue here is how do you manage risks in your investment? How do you um, begin to make it attractive to navigate competing opportunities? And there was also an issue of scale. I think a comment made from our colleague from APP is that you cannot simply scale up a small, um, a small scale uh, intervention to a landscape level. Um, true, however, I think the experience from community forestry is that scaling up does not mean ballooning from a small size and replicating it across the board. There are cases of scaling up based on a cooperative federation type model. And this has been done in Nepal, this has been done in the early days in Sweden's forestry as well, that has also tended to be quite uh, equitable and enduring. In terms of research and the research agenda, this, uh, from my standpoint, I did not hear from the floor what research topics were suggested uh, explicitly. But from my side, I would flag this as a particular research uh, issue for C4 and other research institutions. Institutionally, how do you design uh, models for scaling up that cover the whole landscape in ways that are not uniform across the landscape? That is, the attractiveness of a landscape concept is that it allows for different uses of different parts by different groups that support multiple livelihoods. And I think this needs a little bit more work. In terms of, um, and I'm now looking at the agenda for, for investments, uh, a suggestion that I think can be gleaned from the floor is how do you begin to invest in the critical requirements for successful landscape management. And that re requires not only how do you build capacity, the kinds of uh, technology, the kinds of financial flows, how do you aggregate them, amalgamate them, minimize risk, and all the rest. A third point that we need to comment on is multi-stakeholder processes and dialogues. And let me just say that at the local level, this is well developed in some sectors, including in forestry. At the ASEAN level, we are fortunate that there are mechanisms for such kind of a dialogue amongst governments, but also across uh, stakeholder groups and with development partners. Let me just mention one which is particularly promising, and this is the multi-sectoral framework on climate change, agriculture, forestry towards food security. Perhaps this is an area that needs to be looked at much more closely in terms of how regional cooperation could be structured to realize the potential gains of a green economy. Let me just conclude by saying in my comments that ASEAN and ASEAN countries individually and collectively are at a very critical juncture. They are at a point where they can, in fact, make green economy real. However, it will require transformations not only in policies, because many progressive policies are in place, but transformations in the way we incentivize and implement these policies. But it will also require a lot of cross-sectoral collaboration and cross-sectoral rethinking. And finally, I think it would require a rethinking and reimagining of the face of business. In many cases, within the region and outside the region, business and the private sector face is usually seen to be large, corporate, and in many cases, transnational. I think the lessons from community forestry in places like Nepal and other areas, especially with indigenous peoples getting rights to their land, 
is that when we talk about businesses, we also could talk about and think about, as part of a diversified mix of business institutions, small-scale, smallholder, self-reliant communities that are benefiting from external assistance, but eventually being able to manage their own landscapes in ways consistent with their own uh, values and multiply the benefits from those. Green economy requires not only growth, but also inclusive growth across the value chains. And I think within ASEAN, this is an excellent opportunity to do that. And an enlightened business sector certainly has a role to play. And we have examples here on the panel, and hopefully there will be more in the future. But it will not be easy. And the task for research is to make it easier for those who want to participate in this transformative change. And we commend and hope that C4, RECOFT, I see this RECOFT here, and others could help through the way they craft their research agenda for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much for this comprehensive review of our session. I do have an announcement to make before we close this session. There will be another session uh, starting two minutes ago, from, 19, from 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock in the Java room. Uh, this session will be about, the implementing, about implementing FAO's global plan of action for the conservation, sustainable use and development of forest genetic resources in Asia. The side event will inform participants of the key findings of the first state of the world forest genetic resources, this report, which will be released in, in the summer of this year, um, and associated to this report is a global plan of action. So if you're interested in this um, topic of forest genetic resources, the session will start now in the Java room. So on behalf of FAO and the organizer of this event, I would like to thank you for participating in this discussion forum. And I would like to give a special thanks and applause to all the presenters who um, contributed to this forum today. Thank you very much and have a nice evening.